Thank you very much. Um, so, hey, uh, welcome to the lecture, to the talk about upgrading Django from legacy to latest. Um, <coughs> my name is Kamen Kotsev. I am the VP of engineering at Hacksoft. I've been a programmer for more than 10 years and have about eight or more years of experience with Django. I'm also from Bulgaria, which is a country above Greece, north of Greece. Um, and these are my handles if you want to reach out online. Uh, the original presenter couldn't make it, uh, but fear not, the talk is still happening. And that being said, this was supposed to be a talk uh, from Rado, from Hacksoft, but it won't be. Uh, this is just a tribute. Um, so just bear with me for a little while. Uh, and without further ado, let's get into the pragmatic stuff. So the goal of this talk is to provide value, to be pragmatic and to think about how could we up upgrade Django from a, an old version to the newest, latest and greatest version. And the context is that we've done several upgrades of Django throughout the years. And uh, we have some experience with that. We've done upgrades from Django 1.1 to Django 4.2. And we've done other upgrades of other libraries like React on other languages. So we've got a lot of experience and we want to share it with you. Um, and we want to do that because we want more Django projects to be um, running the latest versions rather than just some old versions because uh, people don't have the time or energy to do that. So this is the quick agenda that we're going to go through. We're going to look at what's the problem, we're going to look at strategies and different ways, ways to solve the problem, and we're going to uh, provide you with an algorithm to solve this problem on your own. Uh, and we're going to talk about how to make our lives easier with this algorithm and with some tools. And we're going to talk about how to not end up in the same situation ever again. Um, so let's look at what's the example problem that we're dealing with here. Let's say that we have Django version 2.27. Uh, it's a very old version from a couple of years ago, and let's say you've inherited this project, um, or uh, a client has come to you and he's asked that uh, you up upgrade to Django. And you want to get to the latest and greatest version, which I think it's 2.4.4. 4.2.4. Uh, right. So there are some benefits of running the latest Django, and some of those are the developer satisfaction. Uh, some of us are developers. We love working with latest and greatest software, not because when we open the documentation, it goes to the latest uh, by default, uh, but also because there are performance improvements, security upgrades, and we can use more third-party packages along with new features. So it's great. And the, all of these give us the ability to do faster development which means we can provide more business value to our clients. Awesome. But upgrading Django should not be treated as something that goes really quickly and is just bumping the numbers in the requirements file and it's over with. It's a lengthy process, especially if you're doing it for the first time, you should be very careful. And it depends on a couple of things. So we can look at it uh, from a different perspective. It's like we have the room on the left, which is a kind of messy room, and we want to tidy it up. It's going to take a lot of effort to do that, and a lot of time too. But if we're working with the room on the right, keeping it tidy is, tidy is going to take much less effort to do. So it's better to work with the room on the right uh, than the room on the left. And you can think about that as your Django project. If you've let your Django project go and you've uh, kept uh, an old version for a long time, then you're going to have a bad time upgrading it. But if you're keeping up with the latest and greatest versions, uh, it's going to be much easier. So some strategies to solve the problem. There are many ways you can approach this. And I mean many ways. Lots of people have tried. Lots of people have. Uh, completed this and lots of people have gotten to a dead end and had to retry again. Um, so let's think about our approach. And to do that, we have to answer a very important question, which is how reckless can we be? So how much can we break? How much can our project um, be offline, if at all? Is it in production? Is it 
currently being used by users? Is it front-facing front or just the back office? Can it be offline for some time? Can it endure some bugs or downtime? Uh, should we be backwards compatible when upgrading? This is very important. And the most important thing, do we have tests and do we have a process to see if we've broken something with our upgrade? So let's look at the first one. Is it in production? If it's in production, it's like we need to be very careful because this code is probably used by users. Uh, if it's not, well, we can basically scrap it and start over. Not recommended, but you can. Uh, and the second important question is, is this mission critical? So is this project front-facing, used 24-7 by lots of users, or is it a back-facing system used by the client's staff to do their work? Um, there is some variance and, and room to um, move here, so we can think about that in our project. And last but not least, do we have tests for this project? In the worst case scenario, we won't have any tests. And uh, we've dealt with that before. Uh, we've upgraded projects that, were, uh, that we've inherited without a single test, without a uh, single piece of documentation, and mind you, without a requirements.txt file. Uh, so we've been to the worst, I think. I don't know if that's worse than that. Uh, but if you don't have a QA process, we have to start having one. Uh, because we want to make sure that we haven't broken anything, which means we might have to write some documentation about it, we might have to write some tests about it, and we might have to gain some um, domain knowledge about the project. So we know what to test about, we, want, we know when we've broken something, and we know how to fix it. So it's all about having a feedback loop and knowing uh, if the project is working correctly. So when you do an, an upgrade, a patch upgrade for Django or any other library, you need to have a way <laughs> to test if the project is still working correctly, and that's what a feedback loop is. The more tests we have, the more reckless uh, we can be, the faster we'll move. The less tests we have, the slower we'll move. The more, the more, the less, the less. So let's look at the algorithm. The algorithm is, we're gonna define it in a couple of steps. So first, we're gonna know our top-level dependencies. These are the dependencies usually in our requirements.txt file. These are the the things that we've added to the project, and they have their own sub-dependencies that we have to worry about at some point. Then we have to look through the code. Since we've inherited this, uh, sorry, since we've inherited this project, we, um, there might be some libraries that are not used anymore, and we don't want to care about those. We wanna just remove those and not bump those and not spend time on them. And then we wanna figure out which packages require Django, because we're gonna be bumping Django and we care only about Django and the packages that require Django and nothing else. If there are 200 packages in this project, we don't want to upgrade all of them, just the ones that are Django, because we want to do it in, one, in, in a single step, uh, in a single task, let's say so, because it's not a single step. And then we're gonna do a YOLO upgrade, which is just go bump the versions and see what breaks, and then we're going to start with the actual algorithm, because everything before that is just a prerequisite, so we are aware where are we th with this project and what are we doing. Um, so before we start, we need to know our top-level dependencies, and how are we going to do that? Um, the top-level dependencies are that imported and used in the projects. Well, we can use pipfreeze, right? It's a great tool, but it often doesn't give us the exact information that we want. And like I said, we've also dealt with projects that don't even have a requirements file. They're running in a production server somewhere, uh, and we're given access to this production server, and the client says, can you please upgrade this to latest? Uh, so what can we do? We can do pip freeze requirements and look through that. Uh, this is somewhat tedious for everyone that's used pip freeze. Uh, it gives us a list of all of the requirements, the uh, top-level requirements and the sub-requirements and all of that. And it does, it's not very useful to know which are the top-level requirements. So to know that, we can use a package called pip dev tree. It gives us a pip dependency tree um, for the packages that we use, and we can figure out which are the top-level dependencies from there. If we 
if you want to move forward carefully, if it's your first time grading a large project in Django or if it's in production, if it's mission critical, I suggest we do a new virtual environment for the project and start the clean installation of dependencies there. It's way better that way, in my opinion. So what can we do? We can install pipdep tree and we can run it and we get a list of packages. Uh, this slide's not meant to be read from the back row, I think, um, but it's a long list and it gives you a tree. And the top level of the tree are the top level dependencies, which is awesome. Then we can get those, but it's a, there's a faster way to do it. There's a command in pipdep tree we can use uh, that lists only the top level dependencies and the Recommendation here is to add those to a single requirements file so you can start iterating over that. Um, so, what's the suggestion here? Always use exact versions. This is very important because if you use one of the other um, operands for versions, uh, different versions of packages could be installed on different uh, environments and that's not great. That can give you all kinds of un un unpredictability in your builds. So you wanna go with exact versions. And let's go to step number two, remove unnecessary dependencies and unused dependencies. So upgrading the Django will lead to upgrading other uh, various libraries that depend on Django, uh, that Django is a sub-dependency too. Like for example, Django REST framework, Django is a sub-dependency on that. So if there's one of those libraries that's not used, that where Django is a dependency, we don't want to care about that. We want to remove it. And how can we do that? For every top level dependency, find it on PyPI, which is this amazing website, which has a lot of information. And after that, you can check how it's supposed to be used in this website. You can find it in the project, you can search for it. And if it's not used, scratch it out, it's great. So, the next step, figure out which packages require Django. This is very important. So how can you do that? We can try, for example, with Django REST framework. Let's say we have a Django REST framework. And we want to upgrade all of the packages where Django is a sub-dependency because Django as a framework is um, an ecosystem of a sort. And everything works with everything else. Django is not a single, package, it has a lot of packages below that, and some libraries can use sub-dependencies on Django without caring much about the version of Django, so we want to be safe. So when upgrading Django, we want to upgrade everything that a Django is a sub-dependency to. This is important. And we can use pipdep tree to do that. Um, if we call pipdep tree and we want to see the reverse for the package Django, it's going to give us all of the packages where Django is a sub-dependency. This is great because these are the packages that we care about. This is the usual tree of packages in a very large project. So hopefully we don't have this large project. We're gonna look into a um, case with little less, um, a smaller amount of packages. So we'll come back to that. And for now, let's go back to the algorithms. So we know our top level dependencies, we remove our unused code, we figure out which packages should we care about, uh, and then we get to the fourth step, which is yellow. Let's do the upgrade. Go into the requirements.txt file in a new environment, bump Django to latest, bump everything else to latest, and run the projects. Run the tests, run the QA process, and look what's broken. At this point, you might be finished, but I doubt it, because it's not usually that best case scenario. Uh, most likely we won't be finished. So, but during this process we can identify which packages could cause problems in the long run and which packages should we care about when we upgrade, because the upgrade process is gonna get done in an iterative process by checking versions for each package and upgrading those. So, let's go back to the algorithm. We've done the first four steps, which is the prerequisite before we start. And now we can start. We can start doing what we call ladder climbing. This is what mid-journey thinks is ladder climbing. <laughs> so that's great. So let's talk about Django versioning. Django versions are usually specified by three um, numbers, A, B, and C. And according to Django's own documentation, these 
AB represent the feature release number and the C is just a patch version. For example, in the latest version 4.2.4, 4.2 is the feature and we have a patch. And the first two letters which are the feature version are mostly backwards compatible, which should be read as non-backwards compatible. And uh, the patch version is guaranteed to be backwards compatible, which means we can count on it not breaking stuff, which is great. And because we have backwards compatibility issues, we need to take a step-by-step -step approach into upgrading Django. So I highly recommend reading Django's release process. Uh, everything that I talked about, about the versions, is uh, outlined there, so you can go ahead and read that. All right, let's say we're running the following. We have a Django and we have a single sub-dependency, uh, a single package where Django is a sub-dependency, which is Django REST framework. We could be talking about something like this, but then we won't finish in time. So let's talk about a simpler version where we have just Django REST framework. And let's first go into the Django documentation and orient ourselves. So, what do we see here? We see the Django releases listed, uh, and we are at 2.1, and we want to go to latest and greatest, whatever that is. Currently, at the time of this talk, it's 4.2. So, what are we going to do? We look at the sub-releases of 2.1, and we look at where are we. And we're currently at 2.1.8 in our example. And when we get to 2.2, we can say that we've climbed a single step in that ladder. We've done a single upgrade, and um, it's a single complete iteration of the upgrade process, which we can repeat until we get to the latest version. So first of all, let's get the easy things out of the way. The patch versions we learned are backwards compatible. So the easiest thing to do before we even start upgrading and before we even start ladder climbing, we can bump the patch version up to the latest available. And this is a quick win because once we do that, we need to go and release whatever we have on all possible environments. Um, this shouldn't break anything, and we should test that with all of the tests and all the entire QA process that we have. And this is a single step we can wrap up, and we can say this is like the first easiest low-hanging tree we can do. Um, and then, the feature release versions we said are not backwards compatible. So if you want to bump to 2.2, we're going to have to read the release notes and we're going to have to see what could be broken. And depending on how large our project is, there could be a lot of things that are broken. So this is a single step that should be um, taken into account. But keep in mind, the release notes are not listed on every patch version. The release notes that are breaking are only listed between versions 2.1.15, which is the bottom version, and the next one, which is the major release, 2.2.0. So we should go into 2.2.0 and read the release notes, which usually looks something like this, and we can see here what's being changed, what's not backwards compatible. There's a whole section in there just for backwards incompatible changes, so we can know what can we look for and what can we upgrade when patching. So we can read this, we can go into our project, we can find all of the occurrences of this and we can replace them, but we shouldn't really go to version 2.2.0 because that's, I mean, we can go directly to the highest version of 2.2.2, which is the patch version, so we can upgrade to 2.2.28, which is the patch version, which is great, uh, by just fixing the release incompatible changes from 2.2.0. That's good. Uh, and once we've done that, we should really have a look at all of the other libraries that depend on Django. Because Django is, like I said, an ecosystem, and all of the other packages that are using Django are using different parts of Django. And those different parts may be backwards incompatible. You cannot count on it completely if you leave a big enough gap between the versions of Django REST framework in Django, you can have some strange issues and strange bugs that you have to fix. Usually, 
Updating the other, the other libraries, like Django REST framework, is a lot easier, so you should probably do it anyway. And you should probably keep your, all of your dependencies on latest and greatest versions anyway. So, we need to find the next version of the Django REST framework package that satisfies the our Django version as a lowest requirement. And what do I mean by that? We're going to use a tool called pipgrip, which is searching in the internet, in the uh, documentation for, Django, for all of the packages. And we can ask it, so what are the requirements for Django REST framework, the version that we currently have? And it's gonna spit out some version requirements. So this current version requires Django to be above version 1.11, but we are at version 2.2. So we should look around and see which version of Django REST framework requires Django to be at that version uh, at least. So we can look at the versions of Django REST framework. And Django REST framework has used only mostly patch versions throughout this point. And we can use um, we can use a binary search along this to find the version that we want. So what this means is, since we've already tried the bottom most one, we can try the top most one and we can see if that works. So let's try that. So we say, hey, grip, what requirements does Django REST framework 3.14 has? And what we get is that it requires Django above 3.0, which is more than what we have. So we go back a step and we try that for a while until we find our winner, which is um, Django REST framework version 3.13.1, which requires at least Django 2.2, which is great because that's what we have right now. So this is the version that we should use to avoid any kind of unforeseen and potential problems. So we can bump Django REST framework, and we need to check that re those release notes for something that Django REST framework will break. Uh, so you see, it's not like a process that can be done like in a single step. It's some iterative process that you, you should go into, and depending on your project, depending on how much tests you have, depending on your QA process, and depending on how reckless can you be, you can either do it quicker with having a faster feedback loop, or you have to be slower and take your time when doing it because you don't want to have issues on production because of the upgrade. So. You go into checking Django REST framework. What's great about this is everything we use is open source, so the source code is in GitHub, so you can go in, in there and check it and check the requirements file for Django REST framework and any other dependency that you want to upgrade, which is awesome. And you also have tooling because we're using Python, and it has great tools and it can help you along the process, just like pipgrip or pipdep tree. If you don't have those and you're upgrading some other language, which is also open source, like, for example, a package in NPM, you're going to have a bad time. It has other tools, but it doesn't have these exact ones. Um, so you might have to go into GitHub and read all of the requirements of all of the packages that you want to upgrade. So here's a quick tip. Since pip version 20.3, pip is pretty much awesome at finding these versions that we talk, talked about. If we write in a fresh environment that we are using this version of Django and we leave the version of Django REST framework without, we, we leave the package Django REST framework without a version number and we do just a fresh install, pip is going to find the best suited version of Django REST framework for that Django version, which is great. It's amazing. I hope you get to work with that version of pip uh, above 20.3 uh, in the project that you're updating because sometimes in these projects, Python is also a, an old version and you have to deal with that as well. Don't worry about it. So if you have this, use it, it's great. And once we've done this, we can safely say that we've just climbed a single step. Of course, we should repeat this process with every package where Django is a subdependency, and here we've only looked at one, and it's tedious already, so bear with me. After we've climbed a single step, 
we have to make sure everything's okay, we have to run our QA process, we have to run our tests, hoping we have tests, and we have to deploy to all environments and test there as well, hoping everything goes well. Uh, this is why we have to use exact versions, the step number two, because if we don't use exact versions, we, won't, we shouldn't count on everything being the same on our environments. Um, so use exact versions in your requirements text, make sure everything's okay, make sure everything's deployed in all environments, and that's a single step in the ladder. And then repeat the climb until you get to the version that you want. So how many versions should you upgrade? Can you just do version Django 3.0 and stop there? Absolutely, you can do it, yeah, you can, if, if it satisfies your needs. But remember the messy room picture. You are leaving your room messy, and it's gonna require some more energy next time you wanna upgrade, and some more code is gonna get written on this project, and you're gonna have to maintain that as well. So my recommendation is repeat this iterative process until the latest and greatest version, because then you're gonna have the tidy room, and you're, it's gonna be much easier to make it even tidier if we want to. So, how can we make our lives easier? Well, first of all, there are various tools you can use. Um, there is a package from Adam, uh, which is called Django Upgrade. It's great. I'm gonna leave just links in this presentation. It's gonna, this presentation is gonna get shared on Twitter by at Hacksoft. Uh, and on the bottom, it's a, um, it's an article from the same person um, outlining how to delete unused code from your application, which is great. And then you can give pip tools a try. I mean, pip is great. Pip tools is awesome. It builds on top of that. Uh, it, use, it uses a different file for top level requirements, which is called requirements.in, and it's good that you have that outlined. And then it, uh, it uses the requirements.txt file more like a lock file, if you are familiar with lock files from other um, ecosystems. And then you can generate that uh, lock file with, by compiling the requirements in, and you can install all, the, all of the requirements with a different command called pip sync. This is great. So. All of mess investments that you do in your project pay off. The worst that you can have is uh, a project without any tests, without a QA process, without documentation, and without versions in the requirements file that's running only on a single server in production somewhere, and you have to upgrade that. So make sure you have tests, make sure you have a QA process, make sure you have documentation so you can make your life easier and probably the lives of the people that are going to maintain this project in the future. And then make sure you have more than one environment. It's really great to have more than one environment. Um, there's a saying that everyone has a test environment, but some people are lucky enough to have a totally separate uh, production environment. So make sure that you have that. And do a proper local development setup. This helps a lot, because when you're testing and upgrading, you're usually not testing in production, or even on staging, or even on dev. You're testing locally on your computer. This gives you a very, quite faster feedback loop, so you can find mistakes easier. So do a proper local development setup, and um, help your teammates on the process as well. And let's go back to the same thing. So. If we can summarize the talk so far, cleaning a very dirty room or maintaining a very old project with all dependencies, without tests and so on and so forth is very hard. It requires a lot of energy, it requires a lot of time. So you don't wanna go there. And if you're there already, just clean it up and make it the best that you can. Um, whereas on the right, we have the clean room, which is much easier to get um, tidier so I think we should aspire to having the room on the right um, in terms of our projects um, instead of the one on the left. So how can we not end up in the same situation again? First of all, we have to realize that we have to keep our dependencies up to date. All of the dependencies, not just Django, and even Python, even the language that we use. 
And even in other projects like front end, which are <laughs> in entirely different languages and stuff, just keep them up to date. It's not, it's not that time consuming if you're doing it on time, because then there's a lot less things to get fixed and your project is up to date. And then this has to get done as a part of the development project, uh, process, as a part of the engineering process. And I am aware that sometimes um, clients have a need for business value to be delivered faster and, and quicker, and we have, to, we have to know that and we have to keep up with that, but we can also make our life easier by having the proper tooling for our projects and saving the time to do those upgrades and keep our code up to date. So here are some of those tools. We mostly use Dependabot and Hacksoft. It's a great tool. Uh, we use it because we are in, our, all our projects are in GitHub. So Dependabot has a great integration with GitHub. It checks the versions of newly released, uh, it, ch it checks the newly released versions of all the libraries and it does pull requests for you. It opens pull requests with bumping the version, describing the critical changes, and I think sometimes it tries to even patch the versions, though I'm not sure about that. Um, if you're not a fan of Dependabot, there are other libraries you can use, and you can also make your own library for that. You can also have some tool that you um, create to keep up with the versions and track that for you and tell you when something's not uh, latest and greatest, and you should think about migrating to the latest and greatest version. This helps us a lot. We try to keep most of our projects at the latest version because it's much easier to maintain those and it's much easier to tell the client that we need to have a day to upgrade rather than have uh, three weeks <laughs> to upgrade the version. Um, yeah, so reduce the cost of upgrading your dependencies by having a good software development and engineering process and by keeping all those things in your, in your head. And reduce the cost by staying up to date. So, if it happens so that you don't have the time to do it or you need help to do it, um, we can always help you. At Hacksoft, we get those requests a lot. Uh, we've updated versions of Django from 1.1 to latest. We've also upgraded Python, even TypeScript projects and all of that. Um, so if you need a hand, reach out. We are a team of very passionate uh, people that love programming and we can help you out. Thank you for, li for listening. So I said at the beginning that there wouldn't be time for any question, Q&A, but there's actually plenty of time. You were very good on time. Um, do you still want it? Yeah, absolutely. I, I had uh, more than 90 slides in 45 minutes, so I thought that it's going to be hard, but <laughs> I guess I was speeding a lot. So just, if you have any questions, please. So I'll put it back on the, on the stand for sure, Derek. Up. Over here? Yeah, you can take it off. Hi, uh, thank you for the talk. I wonder if you had any recommendation or best practice um, about deprecations. Like when you when you were using, for instance, in 1.1 one, one or 2.2, two, uh, a specific, I don't know, like a subclass or method, and then it has been deprecated in 3.2, and then eventually move. You can know. you can you talk closer? I, ah, I'm sorry. So I was wondering if you had any recommendation or best practices regarding deprecations. Deprecations. Yeah, so things that will eventually get out or are already out of 4.2, for instance, like features or um, specific traits that you want to, or what, what you are using, right? If you were recommending, for instance, to say, as soon as you see a deprecation warning um, in your step, um, the ladder, ladder stepping, or if you wait until the last moment, just before it's removed, or in between, I don't know. Okay, thank you. Um, so talking about deprecation warnings, uh, I think it's a good idea to upgrade whenever you see the warning, but most of the time you don't have the time to do it exactly at that point. So one of my points is that you should plan that and you should plan upgrading. I don't see deprecation warnings as something worrisome because when you go to the next version, you're gonna upgrade it anyway. So you're gonna uh, think about that uh, whether you want it or not. 
So I, I don't have any exact process or steps that we follow with deprecation warnings. If we have time to fix those and if they're rather quick, we do it. If it's just use a different version and you get the same result, we just do it and it's okay. But if it's something harder, you really have to plan for it before you do it. I don't know if that answers your question. So, somehow, thank you. All right, as I don't, oh, please. Thank you for your talk. Uh, I would like to ask, is it possible uh, to update uh, uh, this Django version without this iterative process? Like, for example, for version 2 point something to 4 point something? You can try. <laughs> I mean, like I said, there are different approaches you can take on that. So uh, this is the one that we've seen works for us because most of our projects that we get are in production and they are running and they're being used 24-7. So we want to make sure that when we upgrade, we don't break anything for the end user. And this happens by just having a lot of testing on every step because there are a lot of deprecations between versions and there are a lot of breaking changes between versions. So if you try to do an upgrade from version two to version four straight out, it's possible that you don't get any errors in your tests and any errors in your query process, but you have broken something somewhere because sometimes these things don't just raise errors. Sometimes they just break silently and only the users hit these things when they use the program. So since we wanna make sure that the software that we are maintaining is live 24 seven, we wanna do an iterative process. But if you can be reckless enough uh, and you can do it faster, that's great. I mean, it's, it's awesome if you have good tests, if you have a good QA process to assert that the system's still working, just go ahead and do it. It's, it's not a problem. You can also try bumping the version and fixing the errors on the spot. But then these things that I just mentioned, um, you won't be able to account for all of those. So something might break silently and you won't know about it until your users hit it. Thanks. All right. Oh, nice. Sure. <laughs> Hi. Thank you. Uh, one question. Should we update it to the newest version or just to LTS? What's your opinion? I think you should keep up with the newest version. LTS is long time support. It's great to have it there. It's a safe place to have it there. But I think the newest version is also uh, something that gets maintained really carefully by the Django developers. So if there are any issues there, they um, run a patch version you, and you can count on that. So I believe that if you keep up with the patch versions and you go to latest and greatest versions, you have a much easier time patching your project the next time something gets released. Thank you. Thank you for your talk, this is not a question. I just wanted to really thank you for Django's style guide. It helped me tidy up my room in my project and I recommend it to everyone. It's basically a pattern of how to clean up your code. I added a service layer because of it and selectors. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. If there aren't any questions anymore, I also don't see anything online. Uh, thanks again, Kamen, for the great presentation. Thanks again for your attention. Uh, please take any litter with you out of the room. And also, uh, we will be posting the, the Twitter of, of Hexoft yes. in, the, in the group so you can finally uh, you get the, yeah. the links in the presentation. Absolutely. So another warm applause for Kamen for the great presentation.